In preparation for the lesson today, the reading is from Acts, the 27th chapter, the first sentence and the last paragraph. To kind of prepare your minds for this, this is the towards the end of the story of Paul returning to Jerusalem, uh, getting into a lot of trouble with the Jews, leading to his uh, uh, the threat of death and his appeal to Caesar as a Roman citizen. And the verse that precedes this in chapter 26 reads, Agrippa said to Festus, This man could have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. Then beginning with the reading. When it was decided that we would sail for Italy, Paul and some other prisoners were handed over to a centurion named Julius, who belonged to the Imperial Regiment. The soldiers planned to kill the prisoners, and I should say before reading that, that they sailed from Rome all the way from close to where Syria is now, all the way to Rome. And they ran into a storm and they were shipwrecked in the last uh, three verses. The soldiers planned to kill the prisoners to prevent any of them from swimming away and escaping. But the centurion wanted to spare Paul's life and keep them from carrying out their plan. He ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and get to land. The rest were to get there on planks or on other pieces of the ship. In this way, everyone reached land safely. The Apostle Paul was to stand trial before Caesar in Rome. And this was an extremely pivotal point in the great Apostle's life. Can you imagine standing trial before Caesar because of his faith in Jesus Christ? The record of Paul's voyage begins in Acts chapter 27 if you'd like to be turning there. And it begins in verse 1 and carries through all the way to chapter 28, verse 16. A total of 74 verses. Paul had long wanted to preach the gospel in Rome. He had pointed this out in Romans chapter 1, verses 14 through 16. Why would Luke... I ask myself this, devote 74 verses to this particular voyage to Rome. We'll learn in a few moments that it was Luke who actually went with Paul on this voyage, along with Aristarchus, who was a great warrior for the Lord in the church at Thessalonica. And so we learn that I believe that Luke wanted to devote so many verses to this because Paul was like a hero to Luke. And in the future generations, they would be learning about the warrior that Paul was for Christ. And so I don't think it's any accident that Luke is devoting 74 verses to this great voyage to Rome because you're going to see when the lesson comes to closure today, that truly Paul is a tremendous warrior of faith. When you stop and think about it, Paul on this travel situation was given to the care of Julius, who was a centurion. And there they would be traveling on this voyage. They would set sail from Caesarea, and during the early part of the voyage, believe it or not, it was smooth sailing. But Paul would realize that there were some situations that were going to be coming up that he was weary of. There were unfavorable winds, if you will, that forced them to land in fair havens. Paul did not want to sail beyond that because it was late in the year and hurricanes were rampant at that time of the year. 
And so you're going to discover here pretty quickly that Paul does not feel in favor of this situation. In fact, he gives a very stern warning to that of the owner of the ship as well as the helmsman. But they did not take Paul's advice. I mean, he's no more than a preacher. Why take this guy's advice? They thought they knew better. And so they decided that we must go forward. And there was the soft, smooth winds as they departed that they thought was going to give them smooth sailing. And so they travel off the coast of the island of Crete. And then a horrible hurricane takes place. And the great winds of the storm begin to blow the ship out of control And so they undergird the ship, passing the cables under the hull and lashing them on the deck to hold the ship together. And then came the danger of quicksand. I understand in my research that there are celebrated, at least two celebrated pools of quicksand off of the Mediterranean Sea off the coast of North Africa. They are still to this day referred to as that, so those celebrated pools as the Sirtis, the sands of Sirtis. And a ship can get caught in these situations and it's like quicksand. In fact, sailors today do not like the Sirtis sands and try to avoid it. And so they lightened the ship and they started throwing the cargo off and they started taking the fishing tackle in and they took all of the ship's tackle and threw it off. And then Paul gives this warning, this very stern, strong warning earlier that they did not pay heed to, but now he says that an angel of the Lord appeared unto me. It's time that I need to quieten your souls a little bit. This angel assured me that all 276 passengers will not be lost on this voyage. Now, the ship is going to be lost, and yes, all of the cargo. And by the way, those ships traveled with lots of cargo that was extremely expensive. And you know, time was an element. If they would have listened to Paul, they could have spared the ship, the cargo, And yes, of course, all the people. But the angel of the Lord appeared to Paul and he gave him the affirmation that everything is still going to work out okay. Yeah, the ship's going to be destroyed, but your lives are going to be intact. And so, it is interesting that they again then begin 14 days later and they're driven up the Adriatic Sea and the sailors try to to really abandon the ship. The soldiers prevent this. And all of a sudden, they're in a dilemma in a situation where people are wanting to jump off because now the ship is stuck and it's gone aground. And, and a terrible situation has occurred that, that the ship is breaking up in pieces. It's obvious that it's going to it be totally destroyed and they're going to drown out there in the sea. And so... The centurion Julius remembers what Paul said and he says, you know what? I want to spare Paul and I, and I, and those of you that can swim, jump overboard and swim. And those of you that can't, well, hopefully there's enough pieces of the ship out there that will serve as a lifeboat. And as Dick read a few moments ago, yes, it happened that that voyage experienced a major shipwreck. And there the passengers got on boards and they got on broken pieces of the ship as Acts 27 verse 44 mentions. And just like Paul had said earlier, all 276 of them survived that calamity. They all got back on the safe ground. And even though the ship was, was, was totally stuck and blown to pieces, there were still enough pieces of the ship to get them ashore. You know, I thought about this. I'm really presenting this message today because my heart has just really been struck by a lot of things here recently. I've entered into my ninth month of serving here at Lakeview. Where has the time gone? I can't believe it. My sweet little wife is leaving Next Saturday on May the 4th to go back to Fayetteville, Arkansas. 
And there she will try to hunt for a place for us to live when it comes time for me to finish my ministry here. But I'm just thinking a lot of things, emotions flooding in my heart because you know my passion for preaching and I love this church so much. There are broken pieces of life that assail us. I mean the broken things in life that assail us and and bring despair in our very lives today. And how we seek, if you will, to get on the spiritual boards that will keep us adrift on the shores that will eventually lead, if you will, to that of heaven. See, there are things in our life that happen where we get caught in sin. And just like that ship that went aground and was immovable and was stuck, our life can get in a stuck position because of sin. How important it is to look for those broken pieces, if you will, that will afford for us the opportunity to get home to God. See, I believe there are things in this life, the broken things of life that can do us in. And we need to understand that God wants to bless us with that. But make no mistake about it, the devil uses the broken things in this life to try to win your soul. See, he's in the soul winning business too. You thought we're in the soul winning business. The devil's in the soul winning business. Make no mistake about it. And he wants your soul. And he hopes that he can take as many as possible with him because he knows his days are numbered. He knows that his fate is hell. Hell fire that I preached on, by the way. And he wants to take as many as he can down with him. But see, it's important for us to realize that There are things in life that are so vitally important to us. I mean, I think about, if you will, broken time. I mean, broken time. When you think about the broken things of life, first and foremost in my mind comes broken time. We waste away our time in idleness and the pursuit of worldly things too often. It was Benjamin Franklin that said this about time. He said, time is the stuff of life with which gets very easily tattered. And that's an old archaic English word, tattered, that means it's an irregularly torn piece of cloth. And that's exactly the way time is, you see. When man gets so eagerly enthusiastic at his work, have you ever noticed that interruptions become intensely irritating to us? They happen in our very life. And sometimes those interruptions can help us, and sometimes they don't do a good job of helping us. But in our lesson today, listen to what I'm about to say. You must learn to hold on to the things that are eternal. Do I get an amen on that? Without a doubt. Because the things that are, in, that are you know, internal... That are, that, that really matter in life, that, that, that they're the things that last forever, don't you see? And the Christian worker wants to come to shore to God one day. Listen, I want to tell you something. I want you to seize your time on this earth to rescue and redeem every bit of this time. And and gather the fragments that remain because it's vitally important that you make the most of opportunity. Redeem the time because the days are evil. And as Romans 12 verse 2 says, we must use each day to prove what is good and acceptable will of God. I mean, we need to redeem the time. See, a lot of times we end up and we waste our time on idleness in the pursuit of those things that are vain and worldly in this very life that we're living. When we could be storing up, listen to what I'm about to say, spiritual treasures that are in heaven. Are you really taking the time and opportunity to do that? See, I don't have many days left here at Lakeview. I don't want to regret sermons that I wished I'd preached and I didn't preach. Because I'm going to be very frank with you. None of us has as much time as we think we do. And that's the fact. I may not be here even tomorrow and you may not be. We just 
learned this morning about a brother in Christ that died. See, see, what we need to do is we need to attain the things that are important in life. Second Peter chapter 1 verses 5 through 11 says that in the time that we have to spend, we must attain faith and virtue and knowledge and self-control and patience and godliness and brotherly kindness and love. But instead, a lot of people, even Christians, I hate to say, are striving to attain that brand new colored TV, that new fishing gear, that new dress, that new diamond ring. Let me tell you, those things are not important. The things that are important in life is getting the things that Peter is talking about growing and welling up in your heart. See, it's what's important. At the end of the day, you need to be able to say to God, I've learned something more about you today, God. With the eternal, chainless God, one day to God is like a thousand years, and a thousand years to God is like one day, according to Second Peter chapter 3, verse 8. But we are finite, time-bound humans, and we're not God. And we need to understand that. How are we using the time that God gave us? Listen, I'm trying to wake us all up. Look, you think sometimes when I'm preaching that I'm just trying to wake you up. I'm trying to wake this dude up is what I'm doing. Because, see, we waste too much of our time today. It's important that we seize the hours, rescue and redeem the opportunities, toil on in the teeth of interruptions and the broken pieces Spiritually, we're going to get on and come home to God, and that's what's vital. There are four broken things in life that I believe are important. The first one is broken time, but the second one is broken health and broken heartache. Some got on boards. Paul says some got on broken pieces of the ship, and they were able to find themselves to the security of land. I happen to know in this congregation that there are some that have broken health. I know that there are some in this listening audience today that have broken heartache. How are we handling that today? These words can be so comforting. What about those that suffer from pain and sorrow and they're looking for some kind of hope, if you will, in this life in which they live for the Lord. Listen, God will send you pieces of peace and providential care to keep you adrift and keep you moving in the right direction towards that of heaven. There are some of you in this audience today that you once were very strong and you were vigorous. You had the energy. Well, like you see that rabbit on the commercial, you know, with all the energy. You had even more energy in that rabbit. I mean, you had energy galore and you loved using it and spending it for God. But all of a sudden you feel a little bit more useless. You can't endure as long as you used to. You just don't feel like you have what it takes. I know several of you that have been struggling with health issues. You've lost your health. And that's a terrible thing. I've uh, been a survivor of cancer myself. I know what it's like when a doctor calls you in and says you have the big C. I know what it feels like. And I know some of you are fighters and you keep fighting on. But you could be Prince William over in England or Prince Harry... And you could have all the castles in the world and all of the carriages to carry you anywhere you needed to go. But I guarantee you, you would feel your health more important than all that. Amen? You can have so many things in this life, but not anything to compare to having good health. And yet you would say to the younger generation, latch on and hold on to it because it's a precious commodity in life to have. Rubies and diamonds are nothing compared to that of health. Without it, you could have a little cottage and you'd feel like you had a whole kingdom in your very hands. How important that is to realize that, dearly beloved. There are some of you 
You had your loved one sitting next to you. And now they no longer sit next to you because they've gone on. The heartache that you felt. Mixed emotions of injustice and bitterness and guilt and hate and love and doubt and depression. All mingled into one wrapped up box ready to explode at any minute. But whether your health is broken or your heart is broken, or maybe even both, never forget that a little courage and trust in God and patient endurance will help you get on to the broken pieces and hold on for dear life and adrift and come floating towards your heaven-bound destination. See, there are men in God's Word that had heartache and had their health that was in jeopardy. Paul was an apostle that was so important. He had his thorn in the flesh. Let me just mention a couple things about Paul. I happen to believe through deep study that Paul had a very painful situation with this thorn in the flesh. I have my own opinions about what it was, but it was very painful to him, and he lived with it day in and day out, never giving excuses. Oh, he beseeched the Lord not once, twice, but three times to have it removed, but God said, Paul, my grace is sufficient. You latch on to that. Maybe he didn't want him getting the big head. Because he could perform miracles. I don't know what the motivation was. But God said, I'm not letting that go by. You learn to live with that. And the thing is, I I just love the way this man serves. You know, Daryl's doing this study in Philippians. And man, this man, he's going to be one of my heroes I want to meet besides Jesus when I get to heaven. Because I truly believe that he wanted with all of his heart to be able to serve God. Oh yeah, he persecuted the church. He, He carried that as a big thorn in his spiritual flesh because he realized that he had been a persecutor of the church. But here is a man that just keeps on keeping on. And do you realize of the 27 books in the New Testament, he wrote 13 of them. How important it is to see that he wouldn't give up. I mean, he changed the whole spiritual course of Europe because of his love for the Lord. And it's not the same today because of what Paul did as an ambassador to the Gentile nations. But he shifted and he was able to find the broken pieces of the board spiritually and keep on keeping on and holding on for dear life. How many of you have heard of Job? You want to talk about broken health? You want to talk about, without a doubt, a broken heart? I mean, here is a man of God that lost his wealth, his friends, his dearest loved ones. His body was covered with horrible sores. He was racked in pain continually and perpetually. Here is a man whose health was broken. His heart was broken. Uh, He could ask God, what's the injustice in all of this? I've been serving you righteously, but yet God allowed Satan to tempt him. God allowed Satan to do the afflictions that he did. And yet Job kept on keeping on holding on to the pieces of wood, shifting and taking him in many different directions, but he knew he couldn't give up on God. Even when his wife told him to curse God and give it up. Here's what he said. In Job 19, verse 25 and 26, he said, For I know my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day. And though after my skin, my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh I again will see God. Job even believed in the resurrection. He believed that day was coming again, and he gives us hope today. Let... The words of John in Revelation 24, or 21 verse 4. Let those words console you today. And God shall wipe away all your tears from your eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, 
there'd be no more pain, the former things would be passed away. And so what I'm saying to you, keep maintaining a little courage, a little trust in God, patiently endure, and grab on to the pieces of the spiritual boards that will leave you adrift and carry you heavenward, you'll reach your goal. But there's another thing that's broken, and that's broken faith. We've been talking about today about a shattered body and a shattered heart. What about a shattered faith? As a preacher of God's Word for almost 50 years, I am becoming more and more impressed with the reality that many, many Christians today are suffering from broken faith. And I really believe that this message is very important for you to hear today. Because God doesn't want your faith to be shattered and broken. Oh, there were those of you that grew up in a Christian home, and God bless you for that. I didn't. There's a true blessing in being raised in a Christian home. And you attended Bible classes, and you went to church services, and and, and you just kept on... I mean, you had your parents there as an anchor, and they were moving you in the right direction... And and so, being raised in the Christian home, when you finally reached a point in your life when you weren't under the umbrella of that home any longer, and you begin to struggle with your faith because you found out that you inherited your parents' faith and not your faith. And as a result of that, your faith became shattered, and it became broken. Listen, I want to give you hope today. I want to say to you that you can make it that you can cling on in darkness and in doubt, and you can grab hold, please, grab hold of God's grace. That unmerited favor that can bring you to the shores that lead you to the streets that are paved with gold. Do not give up on God. Do not give up on your faith. It may be shattered, it may be broken, but God can mend faith is what I'm preaching today. Amen? No doubt about it. You've also met those that in their life, everything they touched seemed to be spiritually prosperous. They had a sunny voyage in their Christian life. It is obvious that their love was always burning and they just, with the soft summer breeze, made it to the end of their life. You've known Christians like that. Let me tell you, most Christians, they're not on strong vessels like that. What about Jonah? What about David? What about John Mark? What about Peter? I praise God for those servants. They teach me that You can hang on. You can hold on to the broken pieces. And some way through the grace of God, He'll lead you to the shores heaven bound. How great it is to have their influence, don't you see? Because you see, without question, you can really make it in this life. Maybe you're trembling on the borders of questioning God's power and uncertain of His authority in Scripture. And you become cynical and critical of the church and other Christians Let me tell you something. You need to learn how Jesus can mend your faith. See, Jesus will teach you something. One time he went up into a mountain and he prayed to God. And while he's up there in the mountain praying to God, he sent those disciples out in a boat. And they're out in this tempestuous storm. It is horrible, the storm they're experiencing. And during the terrible storm... They fear for their lives, and all of a sudden, here comes Jesus walking on the water. And Peter said, if it be you, Lord, <coughs> tell me to come on the water. And you know what, Jesus, boy, listen, if you ever challenge Jesus, he'll turn right around and challenge you. And he says, come, get out of the boat, walk on water. And Peter did that. And he was successful for a minute or so. But then he began to realize, you know, I'm sinking. Here, here is this boisterous wind out here, and I've just all of a sudden decided I'm violating the laws of nature. I should not be walking on this water. And he began to sink, and all of a sudden he says, Lord, save me! And Jesus reached out his hand and pulled him into the boat. And he says, oh, ye of little faith, 
Wherefore did you doubt? See, we're a lot of times like Peter. We're drowning in our sins and we need Jesus to come and to save us. The Hebrew author said, But without faith it is impossible to please God. He that cometh to God must believe that He is and that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. Hebrews 11 verse 6. Why not climb on in and you let Jesus pluck you out of the depths of despair and mend your broken faith? That's what God wants to see happen today, but... Let me tell you, there's one final thing, and that is broken character. Sometimes we get to a point in life, we think, you know, there's no hope for me. I have really messed up. I mean, I have messed up so bad that I will never be the same again. I'll never have the respect of anybody. I mean, my, my character is totally obliterated and destroyed. But when I think about that, I think about a prodigal son. Oh, he got his father's inheritance. And he decided, I think I'll go to the far country. Young people, don't ever think the far country is a piece of cake. Don't ever think that that's where you need to go because he ends up wasting his living. The inheritance that his father gave him, he wasted it in riotous living. He disgraced the name son. He disgraced his father is what he did. And then, of course, there is Peter, who didn't just do it, you know, part way. He denied his Lord not once, twice, yes, three times. I mean, here is a man, no doubt, that thought, my whole life is toppling in ruin. And then there is Rahab. My wife has done a lesson about her in her Wednesday night Bible study. One of the great women, by the way, in the Bible. She was a harlot. And in her life of sin, she had crushed all that was fairest in her. And all three of these people experienced broken character. But guess what? The prodigal son came home. Music and dancing. He came back to his father. And Jesus, by the way, was restored. Jesus was able to restore Peter. They had a breakfast together and Jesus is in his resurrected body. And he says, go feed my sheep now. And then on the day of Pentecost, first Pentecost following the resurrection of Jesus, you read about it in Acts 2, the church of the living God began on that day, that Sunday, and Peter was the main one who preached that sermon. Restored his character. And then Rahab. Hebrews 11.31 says that she perished not with them when her city of Jericho fell. But those that in the city of Jericho did not believe in God, but Rahab did. And she received a ticket free. She was spared of that calamity. And you can go in Hebrews 11 and read about it in verse 31. She's in the Heroes Hall of Fame in your New Testament. And by the way, Rahab is in the lineage of Jesus. See, broken character can be restored is what I'm saying today. Maybe you've been living a life that's reckless. Maybe it's just gone to pieces and you feel like you're in darkness. But my dear friend, there is shining hope for you today. But it's not going to happen unless you decide, I want to come home to God. Let me talk about some pieces, symbolically, that are vitally important for you to latch on to. Somebody in an audience this size could be somebody that's lost. See, most of us that are here today, we're saints. That just means we're sanctified by the blood of Jesus and we're saved. But but there's some maybe in this audience that you're sinners and you've never been a part of God's kingdom. Well, I'm going to ask you, just grab a piece of hearing what God says to you. See, hearing cometh by faith. Faith cometh by hearing. Romans 10, 17. And then I want you to latch on and grab to another piece called belief. Jesus said in John 8, 24, except you believe that I am He. Now notice every time I say that He tells you what to do, Jesus also gives you the alternative of not doing it. He says, 
except you believe that I am He, the Messiah, the Son of the living God, except you believe that, you will die in your sins if you don't believe it. He said in Luke 13, verses 3 and 5, I tell you, nay, unless you repent, you will then perish if you don't repent. It's interesting to me in Luke 13, he mentions it twice. That must mean that it has a lot of weight. Yes, it is. Repentance means you're walking down a road and it's leading to destruction and you pivot and make a complete turn and you move towards the straight and the narrow way that leads to heaven is what you do. He mentions it in verse 3 and verse 5. If you acknowledge me before my Father and confess that I am the Christ, the Son of the living God, then I will confess you on the last day, Matthew 10 and verse 32. And last but not least in Mark 16, verse 16, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be lost. I have shown you five pieces that if you'll latch on to, it will carry you as long as you live a faithful life into the shores of heaven. And that's where God wants you to go. How vitally important that is. God is inviting you to enter His vessel today and to sail down the crystal river, flags flying high, with the tree of life on each side of the river. And God's vessel will anchor into the city of God is where it will anchor. And you will walk on the streets of gold And you will see the face of God. And how vitally important it will be that God will bless you. See, all of this will be your inheritance reserved for you in heaven. But only if you endure the broken things in this life. I love you, brothers and sisters in Christ. Please take heed to these broken things of life. And please allow God and His grace to carry you home to the shores of heaven. While together we stand and sing.